was just like, the day he came was a day where it was, it was like three foot and clean all day. And he's like, oh, well, can, you can come and meet me in the hotel in the evening if all the lifeguards want to. And everyone, that's three foot and clean. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? <laughs> You're all right, thanks, David. Yeah, we've been doing real lifeguarding all day. Hello, and welcome to the UK Surf Show. We are your hosts. I'm Pete. And I'm Leighton. On this episode, we speak to Matt from the North Devon and North Somerset RLNI. Yeah, lovely chat. Full of information. Yes, so this is a really good podcast because we're coming up to summer. So if you're looking at heading to the beach and uh, you need some information and guidelines, this is the guy. Yeah, water safety, get. talks about the flags, yeah. the rips, yeah, you know, everything, and the things that go on in the day-to-day normal life of a lifeguard. Yeah, sounds like a great job. Before we get into this one, the sponsor of today's show is Northcore, and to get 15% off anything you order from Northcore, use the discount code SS. 2022 at the checkout and that will get you 15% off anything you order from North Core. Also sponsoring this show is Slab Surf. So a few episodes ago they sponsored and we chatted about them didn't we and they're like cool two cool guys from Scotland. Yeah two Scotland. brothers yeah two yep. brothers from Scotland. Yeah so they um, they sell organic clothes on their website they're made from recycled polyester and they all come from ethical producers. Some of their stuff is really cool looking. Got yeah, nice hats, hoodies, and yeah. hats and stuff yeah. at the moment. Beanies, remember them this week. Beanies. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everything you buy, they give ten percent of their profits to the Wave Project, which helps kids through surf therapy. Um, and we got a discount code for them. So if you use the discount code UK Surf Show fifteen, all uppercase, no spaces. On their website, you'll get 15% off anything you buy. Yeah, so let's jump into it with Matt. Hey, I, I, hi, I'm Matthew Whitley. I'm Lead Lifeguard Supervisor for the RNLI, based in North Devon and North Somerset. My beaches cover Westwood O, Sandymere, Croydon, Woolacombe, uh, meccas of North Devon surfing, and we've got a few in North Somerset around um, Burnham and Barrow, Sedgemore ones, slightly different life, lifeguarding, but we're, we're up there as well. Oh, that's, that's up our neck of the woods. That is. It <laughs> yes, is. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Right, well, so thanks for coming on, Matt. So we were talking just for the recording that this is a really good time of year for this podcast to come up leading up to the summer period and, you know, the start of the holidays and all that. So we can talk about, uh, you know, like beach safety and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we've actually prepared quite well for this one, haven't we? We've written down questions for once. <laughs> Thank you, well. <laughs> Well, we've had many years of media training with the RNLI, so hopefully I'll be able to answer them. <laughs> oh, God, oh, yeah, you're, you're you... going to just think these are shit then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose you do have to have that, don't you? Because you could be thrown into a situation where you've all of a sudden got to speak to the media, and uh, well, yeah, maybe we yeah. should get some media training. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it has happened. <laughs> Andy Cummins, in, uh, who used to be in Surface Gate Sewage, he's done some great media training. He was media in Surface Gate Sewage, but I, I know he's been doing stuff in the RNLI and did some training with him um, a few years ago. So, um, yeah, well, it might be. Yeah, might be it is. We yeah, we, into, yeah um, on getting thrown into things, yeah, we, we kind of we have a whole press team to help us with that, um, particularly have some sensitive uh, occasions and things like that. But um, we're all kind of used to, I think. The media wise with lifeguarding is we're so used to talking to the public, so used to educating yeah. people that that that's all we're doing. We just have when we have a conversation, when you do something in the media, it's just having a conversation and just trying to educate people really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um so then like when you get up in the morning and you go to work, what does a day in the life of a lifeguard look like? A day in the life of a lifeguard. Um if the surf's good, you might be getting up early and going for a surf before work <laughs> <laughs> um, and planning about what the day's going to be like. Um, so, you know, there's there's basically, they get to the beach and there's always picking up equipment, things like that, before getting ready for the day. Uh, patrols are always like 10 till 6. So what they tend to do is um, get there, check the conditions and, and then get themselves prepped for the day with a team, trying to make a plan between themselves and check all the equipment and things like that. And, and getting the flags out ready to go really um and there's there's very kind of clear things they've got to go through with checking equipment and and checking the conditions really so yeah um well that leads on to another question yeah. we had didn't we yeah so 
Um, what are the like the safety guidelines for the beach, i.e. the flags? You know, so so people who are listening can can understand what they mean. So we have re- really three flags that we use, three types of flags. The red and yellows are for bodyboarding and swimming. We try and keep them just for the bodyboarders and swimmers, mainly on the inside. Um, and then the black and whites are black and white quartered flags are for surfing, learning learner surfers and hard craft things like that. And then the red flag is mm-hmm. obviously we don't want anybody in the water. Um, I've thought about this question whether I'm going to get it asked uh, whilst on a surfing podcast. As being a surfer and a lifeguard for many years, I've kind of I've had many conversations with surfers um, and lifeguards about you know the interaction between the flags and the different levels of experience of surfing and. There's always sometimes a bit of kind of friction when we go and put our red and yellow flags out and, and on the best peak and, and what does that mean to people and and we, we're sometimes delegating that best A frame or the best peak to some to bodyboarders yeah. and things like that mm-hmm. and um, I think is one of the things when you're a surfer as well you start to understand where's safest to put people and unfortunately yeah. when you when you go on to you know being a lifeguard you've got that perspective where you stood watching where's really safe to put people where there's a nice consistent nice consistent wave coming in whether it's a frame right or left whatever it is you've got that white water coming in all the time that's why we're going to plonk those you know those bathing area flags where we've got the youngest kids we've got the most vulnerable people that's why they're going to go there um so so. are the the flags themselves then are they um so if how do I word this? If someone's swimming outside that area or surfing outside those flagged areas, are they what is it? Not 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 being, being supervised watched, supervised, or watched, basically, yeah. or is that just the the areas you put up as you are watching, or are you do you um, still then have to watch the whole lot? We do we do observe the whole lot. So the, the flags we say that is a that is the most that's where we put in most surveillance. So it's is where we consider as experts, you know, on that on that beach, on those conditions, on the beach. That's where we'd consider the safest place. Um yeah. you know, avoiding rip currents, rocks, everything like that. Um so that's where we think it's safest. And then it's uh you know, it's also the surveillance, it's the safety in numbers by putting people together. We don't have to watch four miles of beach. Yeah. Um, you know, when you've got like Woolacombe, Perrin Sands, things like that, you're going, well, this is somewhere we can, can encourage people to go. So we are watching this area rather than a big open beach. And, and obviously, as the conditions get safer, we can open those areas and we can close as well as we feel appropriate. Um, yeah. We are obviously, when you have rips either side, you're watching for people floating about and going in them and things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there's a real safety in numbers uh, effect as well, because when you have quite a few hundred people in, in, in amongst each other, it's hard to spe- see a lot of what's going on, but you'll see a reaction of what happens if something happens in that area. So oh, I've right, had yeah. incidents where we've had somebody who might have had an epileptic fit or some kind of fit in the water. It, it, it's not, it's medical related. Um, mm. So they're in the conditions, but when you, you might not see that one person have that fit, but what you would see is, 10 hopefully 10 15 people go whoa what's happened here and and you yeah. see that reaction and, and by you know people want to help each other naturally so by putting people together if something's to happen that they're, they're there as a as a aid to each other as well oh uh, yeah that makes sense yeah because obviously easier to spot a group of people than just one yeah one it's person logical when two you miles away it. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it's quite logical when you think about it yeah because i know like um well we've done it ourselves when you go surfing in the summer we like look, look at it and then you look where like all Don't the swimmers tell are. the r and i guy how dangerous we are <laughs> <laughs> you know you've probably done the same as a surfer you've gone to a beach and you've gone right there's swimmers there's the flags there's no one down that end of the beach i'm going down there but mm. say thing is surfing is is actually kind of i think one of our statistically safer sports um you know and i think surfing one of these uh sports like a lot of extreme sports you you push your limits but you Mm. get to know those limits um and a lot of people do and and you kind of and there's only one way you know with with surfing i always thought you you've you've got to get out there to catch the wave so if you're not getting out there (laughs) <laughs> so so it does there's a there's an element of self-limiting it's not as if you're going snowboarding where you can get that nice big lift all the way to the top and go right i'm going down the black run i've been on yeah. the skateboard it makes sense yeah. um yeah. you know so yeah. surfing does have that ability to to kind of limit people's um you know what they're doing and you you do learn the hard way sometimes you get wiped out a few times um so and, and then on top of that 
surfing, although it's quite an individual sport, whenever there's groups of people surfing, there is a lot of looking out for each other. You know, there's yeah, yeah. a lot of looking out for each other. Um, I, I've done it and I've seen it from quite a lot of times. If there are people who are experienced, they will you know, occasionally make the odd kind of like give a hand, give advice and things like that. And, and that's, a, that's a really great thing. And that's why it makes it quite a, a safe sport because everybody, nobody wants to see somebody in trouble in the water really. No, no. no. So, do you, um, would you encourage surfers to to kind of help then if they see someone in trouble? I, there's always one thing with us is obviously don't put yourself at risk. You don't want two casualties, <laughs> um, no. and we see it all the time with us with lifeguarding. I've seen some people help out, and then you end up with three or four more people. Um, <laughs> so it's really knowing your own your own limits. Um, but of of course, I think you know we, it's a community there. You know, and even if you have, you've, you know, you've gone to a beach a few times, you know where the rip turns at a certain tide or things like that. It's just, if you're able to give somebody a little bit of advice, then uh, in, in a polite way, then I think it's a good thing, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, like a lot of surf, a lot of people we have listened to the podcast are either new surfers or surfers that have been doing it for a while or landlocked surfers and stuff like that. So what's one of the easiest ways, I know it's going to be hard to describe it, but without a visual, um, to spot a rip or spot where someone might have like an undertow or something like that. Um, rip currents. I think one, some of the easiest ways is obviously observing from a viewpoint, observing from distance. So if you're, you know, we think of my beaches, at Woolacombe, you can look down the bay, you can see where things are breaking I think before jumping in, just watching it for a little while really helps. Um, yeah. That's why as a lifeguard, I've learned a lot about watching the water and starting to know like when your set's coming through, if a set's coming through every 20 minutes and it's like four waves or is it eight waves, you know, how much you're going to get hammered if you hit a set. Mm. Um, so it's really observing what that kind of, where the peaks are, where that wave is consistently coming through. Um, there's you know, a couple of advantages of that. You know where you're going to get the best waves by yeah. looking where things are happening. Um, and also, rips are, rips are dangerous. Rips are, you know, if you get into trouble and you panic, but rips are the easiest way to get out, you know, out back. So I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm giving this advice is kind of a, do I give this advice and you know, uh, tell people to jump in the rip to get out back? Um, yeah. but, but those rip currents, are, to spot them, obviously the, the waves are breaking elsewhere. The water's coming in. You'll see where the white water is. Um, it's that area of where there's no water, you know, no no waves breaking. There's a bit of backwash. It looks like a river. There's possibly a kid on a bodyboard and floating in it or something, <laughs> floating in, something like that yeah. um, on a busy summer's day. Or if you see a lifeguard paddling around whistling, then that might be the rip. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, my question from linking on was that was, as a lifeguard, you learn to watch that. How often do you take that own advice as a surfer when you go out to surf? How often do you go to surf and stand there and watch the beach yourself? <laughs> or how um, often do you run in? <laughs> yeah, when you yeah. get excited, we, we fall prey to being like overexcited all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, the beaches I know, I'd, I'd run and jump straight in. But um, <laughs> yeah. I, I rarely get to surf much at the moment. And if I'm, if I'm surfing when the guards are on the beach... I'll go down and say, where's the easiest way to get out? <laughs> um, <laughs> think, you know, the you know, easiest way to spot a rip and get some advice is when they're on the beach and there's lifeguards on there, speak to them, you know, or if you're coming back the next day, um, is get that information. But uh, the key thing with rip currents is the general rule is they only go out as far as the waves are breaking. So uh, unless you get an offshore wind, which is going to pull, pull people further, that mm -hmm. is basically the water reaching in an equilibrium. So you've got the, the surf, pushing water in it's going to go in that deep trough and it'll flow back out and it'll go out as far as the waves are breaking and sometimes you might get that set so where we have most rescues are not the really big scary days obviously the small flat days we don't get much it's the days where we've got shoulder to just around head height surf waist to shoulder high head height where we've got a nice long wave period you've got lots of kind of lulls and what we get is people going oh this is okay i can get out i can get out and they'll get out on shoulder height and then every now and then with the 12 13 14 second wave period you'll get a 20 minute you know set coming in which is instead of your shoulder height is one times over you know a lot bigger yeah. <laughs> they see that looming in front of them you know this shadow coming towards them i've got to get yeah. out further than this they paddle further out um get themselves further out in trouble then they're scared to come in then what happens after that, that energy of all that set coming in and pushing a lot more water onto the beach, 
makes those rips a lot more powerful. Yeah, so then they yeah, then they find it even sense. harder to paddle in because they're like, oh, it's gone calm now. I'll try and get in, but that's when the rips really start churning. So. Yeah, I mean, I've spoken about it before, but I've been stuck in a rip myself, and I've had that thing where, you know, I was in in the in the rip out the back, and I was trying to go left, trying to go right, and I was I just seemed to be going nowhere at all. And uh, in the end, this guy paddled out in a um, like canoe thing. He's like, "Mate, do you want me to pull you out?" And I was like, "Yeah," and he literally pulled me like must have been like ten foot to the side, and yeah. I was out of it, and I was fine. But I was absolutely exhausted afterwards because I was stuck in it for so long. Yeah. I mean, especially when you're out back, sometimes you just see the chop of the water going back out to sea and it just doesn't look like it's going anywhere. And it is, once you start to really pick up on it and just observe it, I think that's the thing is, is when you're in the water is just trying to observe what's going on all the time um, and where it's changing. And uh, especially where we are in North Devon, the tides are so big. So we can have the conditions change quite rapidly just by the fact the tides moved you know, over 40 minutes and it's caught gone from one bank to the next. And before you know it, you've got this, you know, rip popping up. Um, and it can be, yeah, we, yeah. I mean, North Devon is where we surf the majority of the time. And we notice that like, because you, you can go down and you're literally like getting changed and the waves look amazing. And you're like, Oh, this is great. Yeah. And you get in here. Like, what the hell's happened? It's, yeah. it's turned to all this, mushy shit yeah. like what, what's going on this is this is not what was forecast it's- and you, you're also noticing in north devon a lot more which is like that you were saying a minute ago those unpredictable sets that all of a sudden just come in like you know a roll of 10 or 20 waves all of a sudden yeah. will just fly through and you'd be like what just happened because yeah. this hasn't been here for the last like 20 30 minutes and then all of a sudden bang and then you know you see that pattern the longer you're in that it happens again like yeah. 20 or 30 minutes later you bang again and uh yeah, we got taken out a couple of weeks ago by one of those. Didn't yeah, we? yeah, it was a really cold day, and it the the set that came in, like you said, it's like every every twenty or twenty five minutes, and it must it was like eight to ten waves, wasn't it? And it just took everybody out every time because it was so cold. Duck yeah. diving, you know, eight to ten freezing cold waves was just hard work, wasn't it? Yeah. It was it was really hard. Yeah. So also uh, wildlife as well. So we see a lot of jellyfish. On North Devon beaches and stuff like that. So, is there a way to? What's the best thing for somebody to do if they get stung by a jellyfish, or what's the really bad ones? A weaver, weaver fish. Weaver yeah. Fish, yeah. Yeah. So we have the quite a lot of moon jellyfish. The one with the um, the see through ones with the four rings. Yeah. Um, so they are they're they're pretty harmless. Um, so I know surf instructors tend to throw throw them at each other sometimes. Uh, <laughs> they get involved in those games. Um, just so, a new game for us. <laughs> yeah, you get little little blue ones, which are kind of like nettle stings, and the same the lion's mane ones. I think you get a lot more in Wales and then, and and down in Cornwall the ones which like a or compass ones, which have got um, sometimes meter long tentacles. They're a lot like nettle stings. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. you've got to be careful. We've got kind of some allergy. Generally, the best thing we say is cold water for them. You know, it's like you would do with a nettle. Um, don't run and try and find a dock leaf, but um, it's <laughs> yeah. just cold, cold water. Um, uh, so, so, but most people surfing tend to be wearing wetsuits. So, uh, in in the UK waters, but cold water keep yeah keep it hydrated to make sure you're obviously not having a reaction. The uh, weaver fish, the dreaded weaver fish. Yeah, you yes. deal with a lot of them. Um, it, some I've had, I think, I don't know, half a dozen in my life as an occupational hazard. Um, <laughs> just as hot a water as you can stand, basically. So right. try not to scold your foot. But um, the the what goes in you some kind of like uh, protein based kind of poison thing, and and you just the heat breaks down the chromosomes or something. Um, but basically. If it's your foot, we feed our hands. We had we had one poor kid skimboarding once and had it on his back. Um, oh. so, uh, <laughs> how, how are you going to get that in a bowl of hot water? Um, oh, God. So yeah, and, and in fact, I had a colleague two years ago um, got got a weaver fish in each foot <laughs> at the oh, same time. A double stinger, so, uh, Jesus! Yeah. That's unlucky. That is. Oh, man. Yeah. I just the, the, the things absolutely terrify me. Just I, my mate Chris stood on one once and. The pain he described to me, I can't remember when it was, but it was years ago, and he described it in such detail, they absolutely terrified me. It took you a while to actually go in the sea in the summer with eight boots on. Yeah, I was that terrified. (laughs) Why are you wearing Crocs? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you see me surfing in Crocs, I look great. (laughs) 
yeah. Um, so what's the, what's the most common rescue you end up performing in the, in the summer? Uh, common rescue, I think quite often, as I said, when we get that surf, which is quite medium height, we end up doing a lot of, sometimes we call it a ferry service. <laughs> so we get on a rescue <laughs> board, just going in and out. I think we, years ago, we had the day where Croyd, we rescued, like, I think like 56 people was the number in the end, um, wow. in, a, in a day. And, um, but then we look back at the jet ski footage and there's the same kid three times on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so this kid Start is just charging off- him. Yeah, I know. I know you have that sometimes, but um, it's a real mix. Generally, uh, people bodyboarding, um, and p- particularly bodyboarding is one where they're not wearing fins. Uh, quite a lot of people buy bodyboards, which is not really, you know, they buy the cheap, cheap ones, really. Um, yeah, which yeah. snap, it's not really that great a float, but they'll get out back enough. Um, and then they haven't got fins, so so they're really kind of holding on to something which floats them, but they can't paddle properly they can't swim properly with you know with it um yeah. and then uh, you know not having a pair of fins means it's really hard to go against any rips um generally when we have them when they start getting a little bit further out as soon as one of them starts to really think this thing that floats me is stopping me you know <laughs> is, is is hindering me yeah, um, yeah they'll chuck it and as soon as they chuck that thing that floats them they obviously panic is set in because the one thing that is helping them survive they 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 throw away um, yeah yeah so that's the kind <laughs> of oh my god yeah it's, it, it's, it just makes me think um can you like can you spot them coming down the beach like the people that you, yeah do you know what i'm trying to without being like it's, sounding it's, too horrible you see them no, and you no, go, no, right no, i'm no. gonna be rescuing you in a minute <laughs> It's exactly when I um I have a lot of, you know when they come in anybody come into new new into lifeguarding there's there's really two kind of key things I like to kind of teach them and and one is about the conditions about the beach about the hazards about the risks like and if they're coming from a surfing background or surf life saving or just knowing the water that's a really easy thing to teach them um mm-hmm. because you know so there's one thing is you know, how dangerous can this thing that we're trying to meet uh, to, trying to manage be how you know how you know how dangerous is it and the other thing is who have you got coming to it so uh, you know i did a degree in you know, like human geography years ago but i you really start to learn about people you know the sociology of it and who why they're there you know why they come to this particular beach are they on this type of holiday what they're doing this family unit yeah. that family unit why they come to croyd instead of to woolacombe or to westwood Ho and things like that uh, mm-hmm. and you start to really kind of pick that apart and then, you, you know, surfers, surfing is huge broad spectrum of, you know, type of board, you know, you've got yeah. a huge kind of, you've got your big sups, long boards, performance mouths, uh, short boards, twin fins, all these kind of different things. How you hold your board, what type of wets that you wear, it, it all kind of, it's really interesting when you absorb these different, you know, observe all these different people. Um, mm-hmm. We You have quite obviously got those who, if they put their wetsuit on backwards, um, <laughs> I'm gonna be keeping an eye on him. <laughs> we, we have, we have, I've seen inside out and backwards. And as a bloke, if it's a zip front, as if a zip back one can be very dangerous. Um, oh. <laughs> so, and we have dealt with a couple of those type of incidents over over our time. Oh, um, really? What well, they've come yeah. up to you and say, "Can you?" Oh no! Yeah, yeah. The uh, the full something about Mary um, incidents. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. oh my god! So on those, on those sorts of, um, on those sorts of things, what is, what would you say is like the most dramatic rescue you've been? Like, obviously, not in too much detail. If it, um, if it's too, what's sensitive, the most dramatic? Yeah, yeah, sensitive. What's the most dramatic rescue you've been involved in, or that's happened? Um, so, um, I mem- I have a couple of really vivid ones. I remember one when I first started lifeguard. My first like okay, I've got to go. And I had just a tube. I, was, I used to work in Whitsand Bay in Cornwall. That's where I grew up. And I remember just sitting on the beach with a tube and seeing these two kids floating out. And I just kind of went around there because it was a quiet day. I was like, oh, there's some people around there. I'll go and just sit down and just make sure that nothing happens. And, and then these two kids start screaming. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to go. This is my first proper rescue. And I run out and the full Baywatch thing. <laughs> Some people are thinking of it, which normally goes to as soon as a lifeguard starts running. Yeah, the that's questions are right. Got, I yeah, got the questions coming up for that. Don't worry about that. Yeah, there's, there's been plenty of times where I've had to had to to jog or run, and there's somebody in the background 
wish they had a pair, you know, set of drums or something. But, yeah. Uh, that, that was one where I was like, okay, that was, you know, when you get out to two young kids and I was only like 19 or 18 and these two kids are screaming at you, kind of like, okay, that's pretty life affirming. Um, mm. Serious one at Woolacombe, I think me and a, me and two other two other guys rescued about forty in like one hit. That's like thirty. Wow! Wow! And that was just one of those where those rips just went. Like so, we had our red and yellows up. I was out on a rescue board, doing a bit of patrolling, ushering people in. The odd kind of rescue, odd assistance of just towing mm-hmm. somebody out there who's out of their depth, and then a few more people. And I was like, okay, this is a bit too many for me. Make a signal. Another guy comes out on a board, and we had before we know it, I had like five people hanging off my board, and then he got the boat in. Then it was like ferrying people in and out. Um, wow that was 40 kind of, people yeah it's kind of, kind of those flash rips we call them where it's just yeah the, the tides super are quick and super strong yeah yeah, yeah. well you um, got stuck in one of them at Woolacom when you were really young didn't you swimming yeah when i was young yeah do you know who saved me little old lady <laughs> No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, was, she was a really good swimmer i must have been about 15 and i was struggling like hell and um she swam up next to me and went if you just swim out sideways, love, you'll be fine. And I'm going about swimming against the, uh, against the ref. And it's just swimming sideways. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> she saved my life. <laughs> Brilliant. He did have all the questions about the, um, uh, do you have the lifeguard, the Baywatch theme playing in your van? And, yeah. Uh, do you, um, so that's what I want to know. If I was a lifeguard driving to work in the morning, I would play the theme tune by David Hasselhoff of Baywatch every morning just to get myself amped up. <laughs> uh, I didn't meet him. We've got, a, we've got a signed photograph in our office from him. Um, oh, have you? Wow, wow. Old, but he, um, the day that he came down to actually, he came to, he was going, doing some tour with Scott Mills or something like that. The day he came was a day where his, it was like three foot and clean all day. And he's like, oh, well, we can, you can come and meet me in the hotel in the evening if all the lifeguards want to. And everyone, that's three foot and clean. You're all right, thanks, David. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing real lifeguarding all day. We've done a load of rescues. We want to enjoy this. We haven't been able to surf. We've been watching it and on rescue boards and, and rescuing people and dealing with lost kids and all kinds of things. No, we want to, no, this is our time to get in and surf. What a kick in the teeth for him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's just stood there. Some people stand in the darkness. Yeah, you hassle (laughs) off on your own. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, oh, I forgot what I was going to say now. I had a good question. I got another Baywatch one. Um, So do all lifeguards run in slow motion? In their head. (laughs) In your head. You're an idiot. (laughs) In your head. In your head, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's uh, all these things are what I would do if I was a lifeguard. You, know? you, you wouldn't know, would you? Because you, you just, it'd be like one of those things in your job when, like, we, I was doing something at your house and your wife said, oh, you've missed a bit. And you're and you like, yeah, that's not even funny when people say that. So it's probably the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. how many times have <laughs> you been asked those questions? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think I just, uh, just lock it at the back of my head and, and kind of bury it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that was what i was gonna say so like do you find do you find it difficult like as well you've done it yourself obviously as a surfer going into being a lifeguard or as surf, seeing surfers who come into lifeguarding and they they have to sit there on the beach on those like perfect days it's not the type of place you can phone a sickie because if you're throwing a sickie all the people <laughs> you work with are on the beach <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know yeah. do they do people who come from a surfing background and think oh if I was a lifeguard, I could spend all my time on the beach and I could go surfing. Have you seen people come in like that and just find it like too difficult to handle watching this perfect surf all day and you're just not, you can't go out? Um, yeah, it can be, can be frustrating sometimes. I think one thing though, with, with being on the beach all the time, you do get the, the times where it isn't predicted to be good and it just, and, it, and you get it in when you, when you've been there and nobody else will be there. Um, yeah. So there are a few times where I've been out or you've been at work. And the prediction isn't like it should be, and for some reason the wind t- turns, the the swell picks up, or tide turns, or whatever it is, mm. and you're in there, and you're there where nobody else knows about it, and you might yeah. just have that twenty minute, half an hour, those couple of ways where you go, nobody knew about this, and it was awesome, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> so, so totally quiet lineup, yeah, yeah. I take it, it live. I take it lifeguards don't use magic seaweed for predictions then. <laughs> <laughs> it has its place. Yeah, 
it definitely we do in in the terms of how busy it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> <You can definitely, laughs> right. <laughs> like, it, it, for some reason, Magic Series does say three weeks ahead. It's going to be four foot and clean and sunny and offshore. So, um, yeah, and um, I'm sure the prediction for the Easter weekend is going to be good. But um, we do notice <laughs> it. <laughs> we do notice it. Last, it was kind of funny. Last October, it seemed to be good. It was quite frustrating. On the Friday, Saturday, Sunday was good each week, and the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was uh, Thursday was a bit rubbish. And we're like, why does it have to be good when when uh, when it's predicted? We know everybody's going to turn up, but um, yeah, it, it is it is useful as a gauge for, for that, you know. And all these different predictions, you, you use that as many as, as lots of other things. Um, but also, you just you have to deal with what's presented on the day. So yeah, yeah. 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 So what about um, the recruitment process then? How, if someone listening out there thinks, oh, I'd like to be a lifeguard, how would they go about it? How do they get into it? And how how does the recruiting work from their side and from your side? So recruitment, um, there's one thing which people, you know, we need to, everybody to have, which is a, a lifeguard award, um, National Vocational Beach Lifeguard Award. There's a couple of organisations the Royal Life Saving Society or SLS uh, Surf Life Saving Great Britain. So, so those awards are, are are prerequisite for somebody to get a job. So they need one of those awards, which you know turns you into a basic lifeguard to get a job for us. Now, um, those awards you go through a route of a surf life saving club, doing it bit by bit, or you go and pay a surf school or somebody who does those courses a week to to get it in a week. Um, it's it can be a blocker to people wanting to lifeguard because you know will I shell out three hundred quid on a week's course and and get a job at the end of it I don't know um, so the R and I we are looking at ways and, and we're running a course in North Devon to to remove that that blocker so if somebody wants to apply they can just apply and if they've got the right knowledge and a bit of knowledge and uh, the right kind of attitude and character of, you know enthusiasm to do the job and then we'll we'll make sure they're good enough in the water then we can help them with that. Um, and many areas do uh, in across, across the country because, well, I'm speaking for Devon here. We do have you know, lifeguards in Wales and the northeast. There's always quite a high demand for lifeguards right up in the northeast. Uh, and there's quite a surfing community up there, but it's a bit smaller and tighter, tighter knit than what is in the mm-hmm. southwest. Yeah. Um, so there's that qual uh, qualification that we either help you with or you get off on your own back. Um, and it's a great um, qualification to have anyway. Uh, I, yes, I think definitely. it's one of those things that once you learn how to, how you can use a board to and roll over in the water. You can put somebody on a board and who's unconscious, and you can roll over a board in a certain way to get them on. You're like, wow, I can rescue an unconscious person without actually handling them onto the board. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there's obviously life, you know, basic life support resus and things like that. So, as a lifeguard, you know, as a surfer who might do that course, it's if it gives you more confidence in the water you know, to help people help yourself, then, then it's just a good thing to do anyway. Um, recruitment processes, we have apl- applications online. So um, 11th of April, um, you said this is going out. So some some might have closed by then, um, but some areas will still be open de- de- uh, depending on demand. Um, yeah. So it's really, look on the online website, there's links there, there's information about the job there's still live roles open then then you can apply or if there's an area where you are wondering whether there's still opportunity then it's a case of you able to contact through the online and they'll get you to the to ourselves or to the right people who will kind of uh you know see where there's a there's a need um and and then we're always looking for volunteer lifeguards as well um yeah recruitment process we obviously have an interview and they have physical selection and, and tests as well so we have a 400 meter swim. So 400 meter swim is under seven and a half minutes. Um, um, and then we have to do a length underwater followed by a length sprint back uh, of a 25 mm-hmm. meter pool, uh, 200 meter beat, 200 meter, uh, beach run in under 40 seconds. So that's a Baywatch beach run. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to make sure. it's great when it's great when I'm testing the guards on the beach and you're going, right, it's the height of summer. You all need to do your, your, your regular fitness test because we test them every like three months yeah. and so yep. in the middle of august you walk down with a trundle wheel right you're all going to walk, run 200 meters between dogs and kids and prams and everything uh-huh. else. <laughs> <laughs> everybody looking at them going so um, 
So there's all this, the, then there's competency. So we put people in the water on a rescue board and make sure they can do the basic paddle out and, and get somebody on it and things like that. Um, successful in that recruitment process, we put people through a lot of training ourselves. So we have a, um, a three day casualty care course. And, and on that first aid course, you really learn a lot of skills. Um, what the guards carry on the beach is, defibrillators, internox, spinal kit, tourniquets, GTN, aspirin, a whole plethora of drugs to deal with incidents. Um, wow. So some really impressive kit, um, which you think of lifeguards just sat there waiting to do things, that the kit that they have to deal with these incidents and the training is is second to none, really. Then we do a lot of other training around if, if there's vehicles on the beach. Uh, so we've got trucks. Then we'll do a day on specifically using that vehicle in those conditions, uh, in that environment. It's quite easy to get a truck stuck on Croyd. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. And embarrassing. <laughs> that yeah, happened the other, yeah, that happened has, the other day at um, the training course, didn't it? Um, that was us. That was the guards, like, yeah, practicing to what when it goes wrong. But, um, we have had, I've had my guard, they ended up on in the metro in the sun once for, for when the truck got stuck. Um, that got the news. The fact that they rescued 30 people that day didn't make the news, but a truck getting stuck. Yeah, um, that's did. it, isn't it? So, yeah, um, of course. So using all that kind of kit, a lot of communications thing, if we're lucky, we'll do some training with the with helicopters and things like that, like in terms of safe landing sites and things like that. So huge amount of training um, because we take people, we want to put them in that environment and, and do the job of saving lives straight away from, the, from their first day on the beach. So it's normally a, yeah. normally a two-week induction period. Lifeguarding career on from that after your first year, that, and, and if the area has it, then things like boats and jet skis, um, that kind of stuff comes in after a couple of years, really. Um, so once somebody's gained the basics of of good lifeguarding then we'll put them on the the jet skis and the the really interesting kit yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, you, have you, do you have people that um want to train to be a lifeguard and you know become a lifeguard and then they have their first rescue and then they think uh, you know you get that either freezing or it's not for me i can't do it um I think generally, no, I think most people, they, they, they thrive off it, you know, and we do a lot mm. of support around this. We deal with a lot, some, some pretty serious incidents and, um, and, and as an organization, you know, yes, we are, we run a lifeguard service, but we've got all those lifeboats, you know, 240 odd around the whole of the UK. Um, mm, yeah. and so if you went and spoke to any of the Thames lifeboat crew about the incidents that they have to deal with, mm-hmm. um, and some incredibly serious ones. Um, our organization have got quite a lot of welfare and support um, debriefing and support systems afterwards because yeah. you know and we are putting young guys and girls on the beach and I mean it took me 14 years before I did my first recess um, but I did it alongside people who had worked two months um, oh, right. you know and um, you know we've got to make sure that they want to come to work the next day and they see it as a positive because they, you know, they did something which had, you know, it was really good yeah, that day, so. which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, um, when when it's off season, what do lifeguards normally do on that time? Um, pre-pandemic, I think there's a lot of them go to Indo. <laughs> yeah. I've actually yeah. had quite a few. There's, I think, uh, quite a few went to Sri Lanka this year. I think at one point you go, if you turned up in Sri Lanka, half of North Devon was there. Um, Where was the in- else this year? Um, everyone's gone. There um, three people on that have been there. Oh, um, in the in the I can't Caribbean. Think what it's called. Yeah. And, oh, God, where is it? Where did they I go can't to? Think. I think somewhere Caribbean. We, we cut that bit in. Yeah, <laughs> Barbados. In, that's, the Barbados. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. that's the one. Barbados. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite, no, I think quite a lot um, of North Devon was there this year as well. Yeah, and then one of our guys, uh, Josh, who's like our low, our Southwest trainer, Josh Ward, who's just you just see him on a surfboard. He just does incredible things. So. um he was out there with his family as well, I think. So um, is, is it just the perfect job for a surfer then? It's just a continuous summer? It can be, yeah. I, I've lifeguarded in New Zealand. Um, I know a lot of people have gone back and forth and, and stuff and, and Oz and things like that. Um, we've hopefully got a, we've got a couple of Kiwis and Aussies booking to come over this year as well to work with us. Um, I think when anybody starts, I just say it's the best job they'll ever have. 
I, I really, yeah. you know, I still, I'm, this is my, I'm going into my 20th season <laughs> now. Wow. So, um, Amazing. I've fortunately managed to make a career out of this. Um, but, um, and, and my kind of role is really recruiting and training and developing uh, people into lifeguarding now. But um, one thing that anybody gets from it is, is that they learn a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge, which they can apply to anything in life. Um, and I always think when we've had people, uh, if you look at, say, they've worked through a lifeguard career in the RNLI, um, they get to be a senior of w- Willock and McCroyd. They're managing a team of like seven or eight people, three trucks, a jet ski, 10,000 people on the beach and a thousand people in the water. Like if you, you need to have leadership, communication skills, problem solving to, to manage all of that. So, so that's not answering your question about what they do in the winter. <laughs> it's like what yeah. they do in the summer again. Um, generally, uh, going back to that students, uh, a lot of students, um, which is, which is great because we've got some peak season, uh, sometimes clashes with, with our season dates and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people traveling, some just hitting the tools or brick lane or whatever in the winter, um, yeah. you know, get a trade. Um, yeah. so, we we um, could do this. Yeah, we could do this. So, and then in the summer, yeah. yeah. Well, I, just well, I said, you, you, want, you want to see, well, you, later you might, you want to see me running down the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, clear the, I'd clear the water for you instantly. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, we have a quite, we have quite, it's not all the, you know, we've got a diverse team. We've got a couple of people who've kind of made their careers and then they've decided to give something back and still want to work and enjoy things. And, and they they come back on the beach maybe, maybe later. So, um, it's oh, not so you do have the, older, older lifeguards. Yeah. As well. Yeah. 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 We've got, um, is, is there a cutoff age or not? No cutoff age at all. It's just about down to fitness. With yeah. That. Any amazing. Or not. Well, amazing. Um, yeah. You know, and so there are, I think there's one guy in Bournemouth who's been, you know, it's like his 50th season or something like that. It's, wow. Uh, it's, Legend. Um, he's, he's kind of, yeah, yeah, he's part of the woodwork. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. no, I was going to say, we've got one guy, uh, Le- Lazy, uh, is nicknamed. He's, he's, <laughs> he's one of those opposite nicknames because he is anything but, and um, he is, uh, if you speak to him, he's still doing a bit of casual work with us. He's, it must be into his early 60s now, although he probably wouldn't admit it. And you wouldn't have thought it because he will give the young guys and girls a run for their money. Um, Amazing. You speak That's to so him good and, to hear. Yeah, and he, you sit with him for a few hours and then he brings out his stories about when he life when he grew up around Plymouth, he lifeguarded in Bantam and then for a while he lived in Hawaii and then he did this and then he did that. And he kind of like, wow. where did all this come from? And that's when you yeah. have a few hours to sit with somebody, you really learn about their, their life. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're fit enough to do it, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm still doing it and I still want to do it. So yeah. Um, well, it sounds yeah. like a great job. So talking <laughs> about learning about life, did you start lifeguarding first or did you start surfing first? I started surfing. So I grew up in Southeast Cornwall. My older brother and a few mates um, were surfing and I just messed around on a bodyboard and was skateboarding. I wasn't too interested in it. And then I nicked my brother's mini mail once and, and, and went in and had a go. I was like, oh, I just can, this is quite fun. Um, and where, you know, I think it was, well, yeah, 20 odd years ago, Southeast Cornwall, there was there wasn't much surfing going on down there, which was quite nice. Yeah. A few little reefs and, and beaches where it was always quite quiet. Um, and then my older brother surfed and, uh, so he started lifeguarding and I was like, well, what else better to do during the summer when I'm at uni? So kind of got into it from there, really, um, had to learn to swim properly, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, actually go and follow it, follow the black line up and down the, down the pool. Um, and, um, yeah, kind of haven't looked back since really. So what about your own surfing then? Um, what do you normally surf and is it you where are you based actually in Willowcombe and that's where you'd normally surf as well or? Uh, I live uh Braunton area and I I'd probably surf Croyd is probably my favorite wave um Saunton on the cave occasionally um yeah and Willowcombe can be Willowcombe can be surprisingly quiet in the height of summer um not just because of the size of it because everybody goes, Croyd, I want to go to Croyd, let's surf there. And Willowcombe can be a little bit uh, quieter or you, you nip around to Kingsgate and things like that. Not yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I ride uh, a longboard. Um, so take it as you will, people. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. You're in, you're in good company. Do you know, some people. of the best people in the world ride longboards. <laughs> yes. Don't we? <laughs> uh, I am. Um, yeah, my colleagues, some of them, I've got some colleagues who work on the technical side fixing equipment. They just still call it my learner board. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it, it goes, from, goes from a running joke where years ago I went to went out to an island, uh, a Greek island, for a cousin's wedding with my girlfriend and my um, my brother and, and partners and things like that. And we were like, and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, she was like, we've got them on a summer holiday to a beach where there's no waves because we're on a Greek island and uh, they're not going to think about surfing. And we go down to this little beach and there's a, there's a guy with a little surf shack renting <laughs> out boards and there's a, like, a little waist-high little wave coming in. <laughs> and me and my brother had to like convince the guy that we wanted, we knew how to surf, but we wanted the longboard. And he kept telling us it was a learner board. And we're like, but we want a longboard because it's small. And <laughs> it's kind of, but um, yeah, so it's kind of a long running joke how I've somehow surfed a Greek, in a, on, a, on a Greek island. Um, well, that's because basically. you're a longboarder. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so do, exactly. do you always play the, um, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of super cool and chilled being a longboarder <laughs> instead of this crazy ripper on a shortboard? Um, no, I've got a performance now. But um, oh, okay, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's an epoxy thing which I bought for like two hundred and fifty quid, I know, ten years ago, and um, still going, my, it's still going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna say, it was surprising that you said longboard and Croyd in the same uh, in the same <laughs> sentence because yeah. a lot of longboarders try and avoid Croyd, like you know, like the plague, basically. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I've always found it all right. You know, I do kind of find it. But um, if you want to, you know, the, you see, you see, you see Bonga Perkins out of pipes. If, if, you, if, you, if you can do well, yeah, pipes, true. Then, so. I think. Well, I think that says more about um, your ability to surf. So you know, you're surfing Croyd on a longboard. I think you've, you're a pretty accomplished surfer as well. Then <laughs> yeah. that, that says to me. I've I've had enough years lifeguarding and paddling around to think that I've spent enough time in the water. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose yeah, I could hold my own sometimes. I haven't really yeah. got into the comps or anything like that with some of the, some of the mates that I have. Um, you know, but I I do do sometimes have to be in the water around your, your Ashley Brauntons and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pick up a few things there as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So where where's the best place then? If people if people want to get involved, people want to help out, people want to donate or become a lifeguard themselves, where's the best places for them to go and look at that? I think um, going on the online website, there is a lot of stuff about beach safety and and lifeguarding and things like that. Um, I think for me, um, yeah. So going on that uh, online website. Uh, surf life saving websites things like that so if you're looking to get involved from a from a surf life saving point of view um there can be a bit can, you know with surf life saving i know a lot of people take it up through surfing uh, who have been surfers normally as dads mm-hmm. with their kids and things like that and and surf life saving it gives you a lot of like physical kind of like a lot of training around being in the water and that's really important and um so go through those kind of clubs will be be fine or you can if you wanted to get a qual there's lots of uh, surf schools that run quals and things like that so um a lot of our lifeguard um teams around the uk all have our own like instagram pages and facebook mm-hmm. pages and things like that and we're really we're using that as a way of engaging with people to make sure you know to to inform people about what we're doing why we're doing it what our training's like how you can recruit how you can get involved and quite often we use that as a way of giving people up-to-date information. So we try and if, it, if we're red flagging for a day, we're closing the beach because of certain conditions, then we'll, we'll use Instagram and things like that. So I think that those, all those pages there, they're, they're run by the local teams as well. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's, they are rather than a, the, the gloss of the RNL as a, as a big organization. If you, mm. you know, we have a North Devon on our lifeguards, Instagram, if you, if you jumped on that, you'd just see what, what the teams are, what the what the people are actually doing the jobs are, and I think that'll give you the best insight into to 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 what we all do, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll link to all that on the post for this yeah. Uh, yeah. this episode as well. Well, um, it's you know the RLNI is an amazing organisation. Uh, what you guys do is like truly noble, and 
it's a charity, isn't it? So it'd be great if you know people listening can can get involved, um, and it's something that UK should be proud of because we have a friend who's on the lifeboats, and what they do is just incredible. And like they'll they'll just drop everything uh, when they need to, and they you know the lives that they're saving is is amazing. Yeah, I think I've when I started lifeguarding it was the second or third year the R and I had picked up managing the lifeguard service from and was trialing it from mm-hmm. from council run or locally run uh, lifeguard services and what they've done is they've turned into a profession um they've really made sure that the the lifeguards have the the kit and the skills and the knowledge and i think it's really good thing now that that lifeguards are with the on light is is really kind of how people see the RNLI and particularly surfers and those coming to the beach community see the RNLI and what the lifeguards do. And then, the, and as you said, the lifeboats, then mm-hmm. I think it's a really good thing for us. Like when I started lifeguarding, it was, it was just seen as something you do for the summer and wasn't really taken too seriously. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm really proud of seeing how the changes come about and how we engage with those who are in the community, those who are, you know, surfers, etc. I think, Last year, when we had the, uh, or two years ago, when the difficult situation where we weren't on the beach um, due to the pandemic and, and seeing how things opened up and changed and and how much surfers were really like how much they do, um, but also how much they valued when we're there. I, I was really that was amazing when when we couldn't get on the beach straight away, um, but when there was the calls, there was people asking for us to be there. That was that just made it just even better for what we do. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, as Leighton said, absolutely amazing. And you all do such a great job. And we're thankful for everything you do. And thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, brilliant. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. If you're ever down in North Devon, you should literally just come and say hi. We'll 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 show you through the stuff and uh, show you through the kit and um give you more of a more of an experience. We'll oh, definitely we will do that. We definitely, we'll will, definitely do that. will do that. Yeah. yeah because we don't go anywhere else what size speedos what what size speedos are we talking about (laughs) I like I like those ones you know the ones that go up over your shoulders as well (laughs) the Borat ones yeah Yeah, I'll I'll be be rocking I'll be the guy rocking one of them I actually just vomited in my life (laughs) and thanks for that Matt what a charming fellow yes lovely lovely guy really nice guy we chatted for him for a while afterwards as well yeah so speaking about his surfing and you know more more about stuff that he does and stuff that goes on and yeah you know i mean how much did oh, well, i don't know if you thought about this but when he was telling us about the recruitment process there's no upper age limit and a lot of the people afterwards go back to do a trade job how yeah. much did you think do you know what? I might try and be a lifeguard. Well, when he said swimming, I was like, yeah, I can swim that. I can do that. I can do that. Running up the beach. Nope. <laughs> not for me. So I could do the running up the beach just the swim bit. I'm not yeah. that great. Maybe we could both do it. And like, <laughs> you do the running. I'll run you to the beach. And then I'll do the swimming. <laughs> you can swim, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he probably thought, just thought, oh God, why have I got to speak to these two idiots? <laughs> but Yeah. But like, yeah, really nice guy. Yeah. Super professional. And, as we said at the end of that podcast, he, RL and I is something for this country to be really proud of. Yeah. It's a, a great charity. And like you said, when now they've taken over the lifeguarding from the councils and all that, like the amount of equipment um, the lifeguards get to use now to help save people is just second to none. I don't think it's they get to use. It's the necessity, the things well, they have. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they have in their yeah, in arsenal, arsenal of yeah, life-saving but, equipment. Yeah, like they? the stuff he was like, as he was reeling things off then, I was like, bloody hell. Like, yeah. There's some serious kit in there. They're fully tooled up. Yeah, it's a but crackhead's what a, dream. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, a great, what a great job, you know. To, when he said that him and another guy saved 40 people in, in like one save, class yeah. as one shout like 40 people you know it's like it's like a bloody superhero yeah it's amazing you know yeah. what, what did you do today well you know i, I made this or, or you know i um got on the bus and worked in the bank yeah what did you i saved 40 lives today yeah you know amazing. And you know there is some people out there that stand in the darkness afraid to step into the light Yes. I, don't, I don't think he appreciated the uh, the Baywatch jokes. No, it's one of those things. That, like I was saying, like there's so there's probably people listening and go, "What the hell are you on about?" Because <laughs> they never saw Baywatch. Apparently, there's a Baywatch channel. You can just watch back to back Baywatch all day long. 
That'll bring back some uh, confusing childhood memories of watching <laughs> Pamela Anderson at the age of about, what was it, 12, 13? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, when things start to tingle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why I do I, I feel I, funny? <laughs> I, I, lo- I love the fact that they binned David Hasselhoff off just yeah. to uh, <laughs> just to go surfing. <laughs> he, like, he must have thought, all the lifeguards are going to love me. And they're like, that's all right, David. It's three foot and clean, mate. I've got Night Rider with me. I've got Kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no chance. I'll no sing chance. Song live. <laughs> <laughs> Just come and have a beer with me. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, for all our stupidity, as we say, that was absolutely brilliant. And we're uh, really thankful for them coming on the show and uh, just. And everything they do yeah, as well. Everything yeah, everything they do and just giving their time to talk to us and, you know, let you hear some of the experiences of it. Yeah. Also, remember your discount code for surface wetsuits, and that is the UK Surf Show 10. Head over to their website and get 10% off any wetsuit you order. Yeah, surface wetsuits. I want now on board with the UK Surf Show. <laughs> hey. Can't wait to try their wetsuits. Yeah, that should be really interesting. They arrived in the post today, I think. Yes, and just remember that there is one in the raffle. The raffle. The raffle that is growing by the day. There's also another surfboard in the raffle now. Yes, that's what I mean. So, we had a lovely message from Matt at Emperor Surfboards. Yeah. Who has donated a timber surfboard, a hollow timber surfboard to the raffle. So, that's two surfboards in this competition. Yeah, literally got a message off Matt that says... Hey guys, I have a 710 Mini Mal that I made for my wife, but she didn't get on with it. Uh, it's only been used a couple of times. I'm up for donating this to the prize draw if it will help the cause. Let me know what you think. That is amazing. That's so kind of Matt. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick it in the second prize, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the first prize is all, always was your board. Yeah, my that's board. Because what, that's what started this whole thing. So it's your board and the inc- the complete setup to a yeah. board bag from North, North Core, Core a, leash. a leash from North Core, a fin from Logfin Co, a wetsuit from Surface, a sea monster hanger for drying the wetsuit as well. Okay, that's going in the yeah. first prize. Yeah. And you've got wax and an e-comb as well in there. And Surface 2.0. And Surface 2.0. So that's the first prize. The second prize is going to be a combination of a few of the other items we've been given, but it will definitely be a hollow timber surfboard. Yeah, so you get a timber surfboard made by Matt from Emperor Surfboards. Um, There'll be some Surfiers 2.0 in there as well. Uh, There'll be some wax. There'll be six foot and clean. There'll be some stuff from New Forest Surf. Basically, we haven't worked. We haven't worked at all. We've got so many prizes coming in, and we've got more prizes coming in by the day. Yeah. Um, One of which... What else did we get today? The Wave. Oh, yeah. The Wave have donated a £50 voucher, which you can either use for a session or you can use in the cafe. Cafe, right? yeah. yeah. So That's it's just a amazing. voucher for, uh, yeah. at the Wave. You can spend it as you like. Yeah, £50 voucher for the Wave. So you amazing. can get a session for the Wave. So what we'll do by next episode, mm-hmm. we'll move these all into packages, first, yeah. second and third. And then, so we, then we better stop the donations of, uh, of prizes because... Well, if people still want to donate, we'll just chuck them on as well. Right, okay. We'll just keep going. Huge. Keep going. It's this <laughs> ridiculous already. This uh, this prize fund. It's absolutely huge. And all the ticket sales from the raffle, all the profits are going to surfability. Yeah, and we did say, didn't we, that so the card transaction takes a percentage, doesn't it? And we are going to cover. We are going to cover that percentage price. So everything you donate will be the money that goes to surfability what if it goes nuts and we sell like twenty thousand tickets well i've just shot myself in the foot if that's the case <laughs> you're gonna have to remortgage <laughs> but we so we're planning then <laughs> i'll reword that <laughs> we're planning on covering the transaction cost so all of the money that you spend on the raffle and as you can remember you can buy as many raffle tickets as you like all of that money will go to surfability yeah and um, i mean when when i thought about like the first part of like donating my board that's another thing actually i've had a few people saying why are you getting rid of your board what's wrong with it there's nothing wrong with it dom is making me another one virtually exactly the same it's because it's had it's your board has has had a lot of attention particularly when like when we go surfing people notice you because of your board yeah and they come over and say about the board so the board has had so much attention we kind of feel that that is the driving force for getting 
this thing off the ground, isn't it? It's yeah. your board. Yeah. And the thing is, like, like I was saying then, there's nothing wrong with the board, but at the end of the day, it's just the board. And I don't know if that's because I grew up skateboarding and I'd have different boards like every, month. every week, every month. Yeah. You know, when I was skating really hard, I'd go through like three boards a month. Yeah. And you have to get into that phase of it's just a board. It doesn't bloody matter. Yeah, I mean, what that what the board is doing is just enabling you to do the thing that you're good at. Yeah. So, and yeah. as I say, Dom from Origin Surf Co is going to make me another board. Yeah. And Dom has kindly actually said, seeing as you're doing this for charity, mm-hmm. this is, I had a conversation with him and he said, seeing as you're doing this for a charity, which is a really good charity, mm-hmm. he's going to make me another board, but all he's charging me for making it is the cost price of yeah, materials. So Dom's putting his own time in for free as well towards the charity. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. You so know. yeah, it's um, growing by the day. The prize fund. Buy your tickets. We really, really want to give as much as we can to surfability. Like if you've listened back to the episode, which we think was episode four, it was episode four. Yeah, yeah. you're you're kind of here how much it affected us and how amazing the charity is. Um, so buy as many tickets as you can. Um, and I know it's a difficult time with the cost of living going up and stuff. Yeah. But if you if you if you really want the chance of getting an unbelievable board and all this stuff, like imagine if you put the fiver in and you win. Yeah. You imagine know, you, that, and you imagine, get all you, that. imagine your own reaction winning this competition. Yeah, you put stick a fiver in and you get a whole setup of really good stuff. Yeah. And I know I've had uh, messages from people saying I'm donating prizes. Can I still buy a ticket? Yeah, buy a ticket. It's going to be a random name selector off the Tinter web. Yeah. So whatever it doesn't. I'm, I'm not. There's no going to be. We've got no control over how it's picked. No. It will just be random names spinning around on a wheel, and the wheel of death will stop. Yeah. And then that <laughs> wheel of names will stop. I keep calling it the wheel of death. I don't know why. The wheel of names will stop, and the, whoever it stops on will be the winner. Yeah. And um, obviously, we'll do that. Three times because it will be the yeah. second and third prize. Yeah, and then after all of that, we're going to have to sort out delivery somehow. Because <laughs> um, now we've got two surfboards to deliver. You might have to do one, and I might have to do the other. Yeah, I choose the closest one. Yeah, what a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Also, if you're on the way to the Surf Expo, yes, which you know, I mean, you should be when you're listening to this. If you listen to this when it comes out, then uh, the Surf Expo is today. Yeah, and we are doing a Q and A this evening. Yes. So uh, come my along. pants are squeaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come along. Say hello to us. Pete's board will be there. One of the surface wetsuits will be there. Obviously, like we said before, it's not going to be the one you win because you need to choose the right size for you. But at least you'll get to see what a surface wetsuit looks like as well. Um, and there's a few other companies at the expo. So Dom is there, Origin Surf Co. Uh, Chris from Logfin Co. So he's obviously donated a, a fin. Yeah. Uh, what well, a voucher for a fin. Yeah. Matt from Emperor will be there. He's donating a board as well. Yeah. Uh, Velomo Surf will be there. And so what we haven't mentioned before is. Um, so the shapers aren't just going to be sat there and you get to when you walk around and see them. So I've heard that um, they're going to be doing a bit of shaping there as well. That'd be cool. And so you can see like how timber surfboards are constructed. You'll be able to see how, how like Dom's other models that he's made and how he shapes and all yeah. this kind of stuff. You'll be able to see the tools, I imagine. Um, and there's obviously other companies there like Huey Surf Wax and stuff yeah loads of loads of people so many can't even remember all of yeah. them off the top of my head sounds like a great day so we really hope when you listen to this you're driving to the expo yeah and then you can see how shit we really are that when we do a live Q&A you can see it normally takes us about 20 goes just to record hello and welcome to the UK <laughs> Surf Show <laughs> yeah. and you'll get to witness that live yeah you'll get to witness come witness the shitness <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'll realise how much editing Pete does. <laughs> yeah, it's a full-time job, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. And um, thanks for listening. Thanks again to Matt for coming on. And, you know, as you said, check out the North Devon RNLI and the RNLI and go and support them if you can in any way as well because they do such a great job. Yeah, and make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you leave us a review on iTunes. I know a lot of podcasts say this kind of stuff to the listeners, but it really does help. And we really like uh, reading them as well, don't we? Yeah. Uh, Also, buy me a coffee. Yeah. No, uh, just come and buy me a coffee when you see me today. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so head over to buy me a coffee, become a member. We're also putting in membership into the raffle, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, um, it helps support the show. 
and it's just a, a little bit of extra content yeah yeah so we've had a load of new members as well so hello and welcome to all of you thank you very much for supporting us yeah we really really appreciate yeah. it yeah now if we can work out how to support me full time financially so I can stop working and just do <laughs> podcasts every week uh, you know it'd be great it would be nice but anyway yeah so see you at the expo or not cheers bye